I'm Eve Pearl. I'm the Executive Director of the Council on Child Abuse. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the entire agency, I welcome you to our Keeping Kids Safe Major Gifts Campaign Breakfast. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's nice to see so many new faces in the audience and also to be surrounded by those of you who have been involved with us in support of COVID for many, many years. A special thanks is due today to our table captains for their support and assistance in getting all of you here today. And thanks to our event sponsor, Foresight, which is a forensic psychology practice that has been a very generous supporter of COVID for several years. To Kelly Mahan, one of our past presidents, Thank you again for your continued leadership and guidance. And to our new development assistant, Mindy Ellis, thanks for all your efforts that helped make today happen. This year, COCA is celebrating its 36th year of providing child abuse and bully prevention services to the greater Cincinnati community. The placements at your seats highlight some of our accomplishments just in 2013. And it includes some statistics about our Protect and Comfort Infants program, which is uh, a program to prevent shaken baby syndrome and abuse of head trauma, our community education program, and our school-based uh, personal safety program that provides trainings to school staff and parents, and then also child abuse and bully prevention programming to children in grades pre-K through 12. Welcome. Go ahead, we'll have a seat. We're happy you're here. Our work is only made possible because of the individual and collective efforts of our professional staff and volunteer leadership, including our Board of Trustees. I'd like to publicly thank them for their ongoing support and tell you that after the program today, we'll be happy to answer any specific questions you have about COCA. As many of you have heard, COCA embarked upon a crucial fundraising effort in 2013, and we are continuing that efforts to enhance our sustainability and enable us to reach and educate several thousand more children and parents each year. Joining us in this effort this year, I'm pleased to recognize Toka's newest board member, Jillian Scherzinger. And I'm announcing today that she will be leading one of our, our new Young Leaders Division. The Young Leaders Division will be developing and implementing fundraising events and opportunities throughout the year to attract new young leaders in our community who are going to be supporting COCA. We cherish their enthusiasm and their fresh ideas. And we're looking forward to their very first fundraising effort, which will be on Thursday, December 11th. Mark that in your calendars, just in time for the holidays. When you shop at selected stores, COCA is going to win. A percentage of all the sales will be donated to COCA. And a big thanks to Romaldo's Men's Clothing Store Madeira for headlining this effort. Details of the other stores participating and everything else will be forthcoming very soon. If some of you know a colleague, a friend, a family member who you think would be interested in getting involved with the Young Leaders Division, please give the information to your table captain and they will forward it to us for follow-up. This morning, we are thrilled and honored that Jeff Bakura our favorite sports announcer has graciously agreed <coughs> to help us with our Keeping Kids Safe campaign by serving as our MC this morning. As a broadcast veteran, Jeff started his career in Lexington, Kentucky, where he worked as a weekend sports anchor and sports reporter. Since then, he has covered numerous Kentucky Derbies, the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships, worked with the Mid-American Conference, the Atlantic 10, and Big East as the play-by-play -play announcer for both men's football and basketball. As a 1985 graduate of the University of Kentucky, he played wide receiver at his alma mater for five seasons, 1980-1984. Currently, Jeff is the Spirits broadcaster for Fox Sports and SEC Network. He resides in Villa Hills, Kentucky with his wife Cindy and children Nick, Olivia, and Allie. I was fortunate enough to have lunch with Jeff recently, and the most important thing I learned about Jeff is that he's just a super nice guy, he has a really big heart, and he deeply cares about kids. So join me in welcoming Jeff McCord. He's also getting old and can't see anymore. <laughs> Usually when I pull in here, I go right 
to the clubhouse, and we promise we'll get you out here. I know the Skins game starts at 9.30. It's never too cold to put kettle in, so. And by the way, shoot, it was Mindy. I'm losing my mind. When Mindy called me and, and asked for assistance, of course, I said yes. Uh, my wife and I, Cindy, are, are the parents of three kids, as, as Sandy said. And one of those, Nicholas, my oldest son, is 22 years old. He's autistic. So uh, I know kind of what some of these people are going through, the, especially the parents. Uh, uh, of some of these children when you get the stairs and um, the bullying that could happen at school and things like that. So, uh, of course, when Mindy asked, uh, I, I jumped at the chance. As parents, COCA's mission of providing educational public awareness programs to prevent and stop abuse and bullying where children live, learn, and play is obviously close to our hearts. Today, we hope to briefly provide an overview of COCA and show you how COCA's prevention programs address the issues of child abuse and bullying in our community. First, we've got a short DVD that'll give you some insights on COCA's mission and prevention efforts. Each year in the United States, three million children are victims of abuse or neglect. One of every three girls and one of every six boys are sexually abused before age 18. Fear of bullying keeps as many as one million children home from school each day. In an average sized school, bullying occurs once every seven minutes. One out of every four young bullies will have a criminal record by age 30. Over 25% of adolescents and teens have been bullied repeatedly through their cell phones or the internet. Since year 2000, over 300 cases of shaken baby syndrome have been documented at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, including 51 deaths. Two-thirds of babies who are shaken die or suffer permanent disabilities. Child abuse and bullying are very difficult and complex issues. They trigger many emotions in each of us, including anger, fear, sadness, helplessness, and much pain, especially for those who have experienced it firsthand or know someone who has. The mission of the Council on Child Abuse of Southern Ohio, COCA, is to provide educational and public awareness programs to prevent and stop abuse and bullying where children live, learn, and play. Every day, staff and dedicated volunteers work to create safe environments for children and remove barriers to learning. Kids can't learn if they are hungry, tired, or worried about violence, witnessing it, or being the victim of adults abusing them or being abused or bullied by their peers. The statistics on child abuse and bullying can be shocking and overwhelming, but there is one fact that gives COCA hope. Child abuse and bullying are 100% preventable. Kids' lives are priceless. Keeping them safe isn't cheap. What is keeping a child safe worth to you? that focuses on the prevention of child abuse and bullying. COCA has maximized the program quality and effectiveness through connections and collaborations with many service providers in our community, and at the same time, they've been successful at minimizing costs of their programs. As an example, an investment in the school program of less than $10 per abused or bullied child can save a child from not just paying a terrible price in terms of their own physical and mental anguish, would save families or society thousands of dollars as well. According to the Ohio <laughs> Department of Mental Health, one year of weekly counseling for just one child costs $6,240. It's one child. And we now have a better understanding of how much abuse and neglect is costing our society. A $104 billion per year, that's billion with a B, or about $1,500 per family. 
The medical costs associated with the initial and long-term care for babies who are shaken is substantial, with estimates ranging from $300,000 to over a million dollars for just the first five years of care for severely injured SBS babies that survived the initial injury. To address the issue of shaken baby syndrome and abuse of head trauma, COCA has its Protect and Comfort Infants program, affectionately referred to as PASI, kind of like a pacifier. COCA collaborators with all the area hospitals that have birthing units in the past year will distribute over 20,000 educational packets to mothers of newborns. In addition to the hospitals, COCA collaborates with the Help Me Grow program at Lighthouse Youth Services, the Meyerson Center, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and is currently looking at new opportunities for collaborating with the Cincinnati Health Department. Throughout the year, trained staff and volunteers will provide 2,000 face-to-face visits with mothers of newborns at both Good Sam and Bethesda North Hospitals. These PASI prevention efforts continue to lead to better outcomes for infants in our community. We also help them to reach their full potential by providing their parents and caregivers life-saving information and the normalcy of crying and ways to cope with crying and the dangers of shaking. I want to recognize the staff person who oversees the passing program, Felice Young. Where's Felice? And a hospital face-to-face -face visits. Thanks guys, we appreciate everything that you do. Now let's talk a little about COCA's school-based personal safety program. COCA staff provides individual classroom presentations to over 50 different schools each year, and that's focused on child abuse and bullying. Following the presentations, children can volunteer to come out and talk individually about questions they have about the presentation or share their own concerns about their own situations. It's amazing to think that after only one 45-minute presentation, kids feel safe enough to share something, their deepest, darkest secret sometimes. The fact that last year alone, over 1,000 kids came out and disclosed information that required further adult intervention, uh, intervention, I think speaks volumes about how effectively the COCA staff gets their prevention message across, and more importantly, how quickly COCA staff connect to kids of all ages, making them feel safe enough to share their personal concerns. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce three students from the School of Creative and Performing Arts who will reenact real disclosures that COCA staff received last year. And I need to clarify something. These disclosures are not from their school. Rather, they represent three different schools that COCA served last year. And it's also important for you guys to remember that all these disclosures that you hear today, including those that you'll see later on the screen and the ones on the frames on your tables, they're all based on actual disclosures COCA staff received from kids last year. In some cases, some of the details even had to be admitted, omitted because of the graphic nature of the story. So all these you're about to see are true stories. First of all, we're going to hear from Roderick, who disclosed a bully situation to Coca when he was in the fifth grade. Roderick? When I was in fifth grade, Coca came to my school and did a presentation on bullying. We watched a DVD called Gum in My Hair, and we did a fun little activity about not making snap judgments about other people. Well, after the presentation, we were allowed to talk one-on-one -on -one with the COCA representative. And I told Miss Elizabeth that I was being bullied by two boys. They would punch me all the time and say mean things to me. And one was Charles. He would steal things from me. He would punch me and threaten to kill me if I told anyone. The other was Dominic. And he sat next to me in class. They would bully me all the time in school and at the aftercare program at our school. They were both really mean and bullied other kids, too. And before Coca came to our school, I reported it to teachers, but nothing ever happened. And I was too afraid to tell my teachers because I, I was afraid that they would do something bad because they'd be so mad. You know, after that, uh, I, I didn't go to school. I would pretend I was sick because I didn't know what else to do. But I was really glad when COCA came and helped me find a better solution.
Next is Daryl, who disclosed physical abuse to Coco when he was in the third grade. Daryl? When I was in the third grade, I remember Coca came to my school and did a presentation about child abuse. They showed us all the ways that adults could harm children, and they showed us four safety rules. The biggest one was to always tell someone if you were being hurt. So I decided to tell the Coca person about what was going on in my family. I told the Coca person, Miss Felice, that my dad always yelled at everyone and he only cared about our cat. I said he was really abusive. One time, I accidentally threw his paycheck in the trash. He threw me against a chair, knocked out my tooth. My mom helped me get the tooth taken care of. Both my parents beat me, my mom with a belt and my dad with his hand. But my dad was really abusive. He would beat our dog and make him squeal. He even hit my mom. One time, we had to go across the street to the neighbors just to get away from him. My dad always, my mom always said he was abusive. One time he picked me up and threw me back on the ground. He'd always slap my sister and hit my mom on her arm. My mom called 911 and the police showed up. It was really hard. Luckily, after I told, my family got some help, and things started to get better. And finally, Sarah will share a real disclosure about sexual abuse when she was only nine years old. person about what happened to me. I told her I accidentally saw my stepbrother's private parts a lot. My stepbrother Adam was 14 at the time, and we liked to play together, wrestling in the bedroom. But he would always take me into the closet, pull his pants down, rub against me, and do what big people did. He would never let me out of the closet if I tried to, if I tried to run away before he rubbed against me. My clothes were always on. Even though this happened all the time for about two years, I never told anyone because I was scared Adam and I would get in trouble. Adam had already been in really big trouble a few months before because he had run away. The police had to be called and he was grounded. I was sad then because we couldn't play together. It gets confusing though because I have two families. I have my stepmom and my dad and Adam and his older brothers who are really, really old. And then I have my dad, my mom, and my stepdad, and my little sister. I always would stay with my dad and my stepmom on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. My stepmom was really mean. She yelled at us and made us do chores all the time. I was so scared of what would happen. Miss Kathy told me that she had to share this information with the guidance counselor so, she, so we could make sure that I was safe, and she wanted to get Adam help so it didn't happen again. You can't help but wonder how long these kids would have continued to be bullied, abused, or haunted by their abuse if Coca had not intervened in their behalf. first victim, nor was I his last. At 16, I should have been worried about whether I got an A in biology or whether that cute boy in English class was going to take me to the football game. But instead, I found myself worrying about whether 
the pastor was going to sexually violate me that day. I worried about his violent temper and wondered if the next time I was with him, he was going to hit me again. I felt like I was in a black hole with no way out and no one to confide in. His words, don't ever tell anyone, and what would happen to me if anyone ever found out, paralyzed me. Fear gripped me. And oftentimes he would remind me, who's going to believe you anyway? No one's gonna believe you. And he finally convinced me of that. His abuse continued for five years. Eventually, his actions were discovered, and the elders of the church, in an effort to protect the pastor and his family, told me once again not to tell anybody, not even my parents. But as rumors began to swirl, and more and more people in the church began to find out, I eventually did tell my parents. And he was moved to another church in Tennessee. Shortly thereafter, I was um, called to the church and I was told that I had to leave, that I was no longer, I was no longer fit to worship there. I was devastated. Um, I loved that church, so I left. For 35 years, I never spoke about my abuse to anyone. My closest friends, and not even my husband knew. And I was always fearful someone would learn about what I had done. I carried that secret of guilt and shame for 35 years. Then about 10 years ago, at age 49, I was driving out of town to see my daughter play in a golf tournament in Tennessee. And I saw an exit sign. And I realized that I was within minutes of where my abuser had moved to after leaving Cincinnati 35 years earlier. and I began to cry, and I pulled to the side of the road, and I, I cried uncontrollably and sobbed for almost 20 minutes. And it was for the first time I began to realize what his abuse had done to me and continued to do to me all those years later. I eventually um, confided in my friend Sue, who's with me, and I told my husband. Part of the healing for me was that I, I felt the need to confront him and confront this abuser for what he had done to me. So I hired a private investigator, and I found him in a church in Alabama, and I confronted him. And that began my process of being able to heal from this abuse 35 years earlier. My journey of healing has been very difficult at times. Healing from emotional sexual abuse is difficult. It's, it's hard work. He took so much from me. He really changed who I was and what I could have become. Silence is the abuser's friend. I want to say that again. Silence is the abuser's friend. Secrets protect the perpetrator, and the secrets keep him safe, 
and allow him to continue to abuse over and over and over. That is why the work of the Council on Child Abuse is so important. Their message to children that it's okay to tell is vital in stopping child abuse. How different my life would have been had I known it was safe to tell someone the heartache and the pain that I could have been spared, not at, only at the time that it was happening, but 35 years later. Being able to tell a child it's okay, it's okay to tell, is so important. We can stop child abuse, child abuse, sexual child abuse, by giving children the power and the knowledge to say no. It is far easier to prevent evil than to recover from it. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Darius Brown, Freddie Staub, and Hannah Waskowitz for volunteering their time and sharing these real disclosures with you today. And Sandy, thank you for being so brave and open with your own personal story. Once again, let's give them all a At this time, I'm pleased to introduce another Sandy, Sandy Brave, a retired kindergarten teacher from the Sycamore School District and also a very committed member of COCA's Board of Trustees and Executive Committee. Sandy will share her perspective and provide details about how each of us can offer our support to keeping kids safe. Our intervention specialists are here today, so I'd like to recognize all of them. We have Elizabeth, Kim, Diane, Anne, Allie, Chris, Felice, and they're a fearless leader who, organ who coordinates the school program is Rebecca Joy. And um, without all of your hard work and all of the things that you do, the kids uh, wouldn't have a voice, and the disclosures that COCA receives would not be taking place. So I'd like everyone to please all of those people to please stand up so we can recognize you for the good job you're doing. if you ever come by the coca office and hear the stories you'll understand how important this work is and what these girls really do mine out of these students I joined the Board of Directors for the Council on Child Abuse almost three years ago after retiring from teaching for 35 years. My reason for joining was that COCA's mission coincides with um, what I believe is the reason why I'm on this planet, and that's to help children. I've known that abuse and bullying have gone on for years and years, decades, probably centuries, but what I didn't know until I started volunteering in this job is how many, many people are affected. The more I get around and talk to people and meet people, I hear their stories. I cringe 
from the sadness and the continuing challenges that people endure. We all hear the stories, we read them in the newspaper, and we truly think, oh, how awful. And then we go on with our lives. And then the next week, there's another article in the paper, and we all read it, and we think, oh, how awful. And then we go on with our lives. It's really not a comfortable topic to talk about. So we sweep it under the rug, and we try to avoid it. But these people are wounded. They're hurting. Many keep it a secret. Case in point right here, Sandy Kirkham. Wounded, hurting. She kept it a secret because she thought she had to. And Coco were trying to let, get the message out. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is the most harmful thing that can happen to a human is keeping a secret. It festers, it grows, it, it's toxic. So what to do? I just felt I had to do something. It's for the children. So here I am, out of my comfort zone, standing up here in front of all of you, trying to do my one thing. And I'm asking all of you to consider getting out of your comfort zone and help us to protect children. We have to prevent this. We just have to. This time I'm going to put the table captains to work and I'm going to ask all of the table captains to pass out the commitment cards. Uh, they should have, the table captains have a folder and there are commitment cards inside. And I would appreciate, I'll give you a minute to maybe pass this out. I'd like you to take a moment and review the different giving, er, different giving levels and how that they impact COVID prevention programs. Please know that your commitment at any level is meaningful to COCA and deeply appreciated. You'll see that there are three lines for um, 2014, 2015, and 2016. So you can do a one-time donation if, you're, if you feel you'd like to do that, or if you'd like to do a three-year commitment, you can mark 2014, 2015, 2016. We'd appreciate if you would fill in your name and your address. And then there are three options on there uh, that you can complete your donation. One is you can write a check and close that, or you can provide the information for, to charge to your credit card, or you can request that we send you an invoice. Any one of those options would work. As you think about what keeping kids safe is worth to you, please remember that for every additional 100 kids that COCA is able to serve, at least six disclose information requiring adult intervention. My husband Chuck and I are very committed to COCA's mission and we ourselves have made a three-year commitment. In closing, on behalf of our entire agency, I'd like to say thanks again to Jeff Picurro. I'd like to say thank you for the to the students from the School of Creative and Performing Arts, you guys did a great job. I'd like to say a special heartfelt thanks to Sandy Kirkham, who is just wonderful. And by the way, she's a wonderful human being. She's come out of this in a very awesome way. I'd like to um, thank the Indian Hill Video Department and Ali Sander for her assistance with the PowerPoint and music. And I'd like to thank all of the table captains here for their help in uh, passing out the commitment cards. And, and I would also like to thank all of you for taking the, taking the time out of your hectic schedules and attending this morning. I hope we were able to touch your heart. And as you get ready to sign your commitment card, I'd like to end with a quote from Dr. Seuss. Being a teacher, I always have to get the literature in there. And it goes like this. It's 
from the Lorex. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Take it down. Oh,